I am a ridiculous woman. They call me a mad woman now. That would be a distinct rise in my social position were it not that they still regard me as being ridiculous too. But that doesn't make me angry anymore. They are all dear to me now, even while they laugh at me. Yes. Even then they are for some reason particularly dear to me. I love them. Of course I do. And I admit I do feel sad because they do not know the truth. Or as I know it. Oh, how hard it is to be the only woman to know the truth. They won't understand that. Not yet. They won't understand. In the past, I used to get really distressed at appearing to be ridiculous. No, not appearing to be, but being ridiculous. I've always cut a ridiculous figure. I suppose I must have known it from the day I was born. At any rate, I've known for certain that I was ridiculous ever since I was seven years old. Afterward, I went to school, then to the university, and, well, the more I learned, the more conscious I became of the fact that I was ridiculous. In fact, I'm an utterly absurd person. Every year the same consciousness that I was ridiculous in every way strengthened and intensified. And everyone has always laughed at me. But not one of them knew or suspected that if there were one woman on earth who knew better than anyone else that she was ridiculous, that woman was me. And the reason for telling you all this? Well, it was only after I honestly understood I was ridiculous and indeed a mad woman that I crucially learned the truth. The most important truth. I learned the truth last November, on the 3rd of November, to be precise, and every moment since then has been imprinted indelibly on my mind. It happened on a dismal evening, as dismal an evening as could be imagined. I was returning home, at about eleven o'clock. It had been pouring all day, and the rain too was the coldest and most dismal rain that ever was. A sort of menacing rain. I remember that. A rain with a distinct animosity toward people. But about eleven o'clock it had stopped, suddenly, and I remember feeling hungry. I had scarcely any dinner as I spent the evening with an engineer who had two more friends visiting him. I never opened my mouth. They were discussing some highly controversial subject and suddenly got very excited over it. But I could see it really did not make any difference to them. I knew that their excitement was not genuine, so I suddenly blurted out, My dear fellows, I said, you don't really care a damn about it, do you? They were not in the least offended, but they all burst out laughing at me. That was because I had said it without meaning to chastise them, but simply because it made no difference to me. Well, they realised that it made no difference to me, and they felt happy. When I was walking home, I was thinking about the gaslight in the streets. I looked up at the sky. It was awfully dark. But I could clearly distinguish the torn wisps of cloud, and between them fathomless dark patches. All of a sudden I became aware of a little star in one of those patches, and I began looking at it intently. That was because the little star gave me an idea. I made up my mind to kill myself that night. I had made up my mind to kill myself already two months before, and, although I am poor, I bought myself an excellent revolver and loaded it the same day. But two months had elapsed, and it was still lying in the drawer. I was so utterly indifferent to everything that I was anxious to wait for the moment when I would not be so indifferent, and then kill myself. Why? I don't know. And so, every night, during these two months, I thought of shooting myself. I was just waiting for the right moment. And now the little star gave me an idea. And I made up my mind, then and there, that it should most certainly be that night. But why the little star gave me the idea, I don't know. And just as I was looking at the sky, this little girl suddenly grasped me by the elbow. The street was already deserted and there was scarcely a soul to be seen. In the distance, a cabman was fast asleep on his box. 
white girl was about eight years old. She was soaked to the skin. But what stuck in my memory was her shabby clothes and torn little wet boots. The boots caught my eye especially. She suddenly began tugging at my elbow and calling me. She was not crying, but saying something in a loud, jerky sort of voice. Something that did not make sense. For she was trembling all over and her teeth were chattering from cold. She seemed to be terrified of something, and she was crying desperately. Mummy! Mummy! I turned around to look at her, but did not utter a word and went on walking. But she ran after me, tugging at my clothes, and there was a sound of despair in her voice, signifying how frightened she was. Her words sounded as if they were choking her. I realised in the same moment that her mother must be dying somewhere very near, or that something similar was happening to her, and that she had run out to call someone, to find someone who would help her mother. But I did not go with her. On the contrary, something made me drive her away. At first I told her to go and find a policeman, but she suddenly clasped her hands and whimpering and gasping for breath kept running at my side and would not leave me. It was then that I stamped my foot and shouted at her. She just cried, Please, please. And then she left me suddenly and rushed headlong across the road. Another woman appeared there, and she evidently rushed from me to her. I was relieved to arrive home. I climbed to the fifth floor. I live apart from my landlord. We all have separate rooms as in a hotel. My room is very small and poor. I sat down in the armchair, lighted the candle and began thinking. Next door in the other room the retired army captain had visitors again. Six merry gentlemen who drank vodka and played faro with an old pack of cards. Last night they had a fight. The landlady wanted to complain, but she's dreadfully afraid of the captain. We had only one more lodger in our rooms, a thin little lady, the wife of an army officer, on a visit to Petersburg with her three little children, who had all been taken ill since their arrival at our house. I don't hear them at all. So completely do I forget about them. You see, I stay awake all night till daybreak, and that has been going on for a whole year now. I sit up all night in the armchair at the table, doing nothing. I read books only in the daytime. At night, I sit like that without even thinking about anything in particular. Some thoughts wander in and out of my mind, and I let them come and go as they please. In the night, the candle burns out completely. I sat down at the table took the gun out of the drawer and put it down in front of me. I remember asking myself as I put it down, is it to be then? And I replied with complete certainty, it is. I knew I should shoot myself that night for certain. What I did not know was how much longer I should go on sitting at the table till I shot myself. And I should, of course, have shot myself had it not been for the little girl. I know I should have helped that poor child. Why didn't I help that little girl? Was it because I knew I had decided to do away with myself that night so everything in the world was more indifferent to me than ever? Then why should I feel suddenly not indifferent and sorry for the little girl? Plagued by questions like... Why, after all, did I stamp and shout so fiercely at the little girl? I remember that I was very sorry for her, so much so that I felt a strange pang, which was quite incomprehensible in my position. I mean, what did that little girl matter to me, since in another two hours everything would become extinct? If I were to shoot myself, the world would cease to exist. For me, at any rate. I remember that, as I sat and meditated, I began to examine all these questions which thronged my mind one after another. 
I realised the little girl, in fact, had saved me. For by these questions, I put off my own execution. It was at that moment that I suddenly fell asleep in my armchair at the table. A thing that had never happened to me before. Dreams, as we all know, are very curious things. Certain incidents in them are presented with quite uncanny vividness. Each detail executed with the finishing touch of a jeweller. While others you leap across as though entirely unaware of, for instance, space and time. Dreams seem to be induced not by reason, but by desire. Not by the head, but by the heart. And yet, what clever tricks my reason has sometimes played on me in dreams. And furthermore, what incomprehensible things happen to it in a dream. My brother, for instance, died five years ago. I sometimes dream about him. He takes a keen interest in my affairs. We are both very interested, and yet I know very well all through my dream that my brother is dead and buried. How is it that I am not surprised that, though dead, he is here beside me, doing his best to help me? Why does my reason accept all this without the slightest hesitation? But enough. Let me tell you about my dream. Yes, I dreamed that dream that night. My dream of the 3rd of November. They are making fun of me now by saying that it was only a dream. But what does it matter whether it was a dream or not? so long as a dream revealed the truth to me. For once you have recognised the truth and seen it, you know it is the one and only truth, and that there can be no other, whether you are asleep or awake. But never mind. Let it be a dream. But remember that I had intended to cut short by suicide the life that means so much to us that my dream, my dream, oh, it revealed to me a new, grand, regenerated, strong life. Listen, I have said that I fell asleep imperceptibly, and even while I seemed to be revolving the same thoughts again in my mind, suddenly I dreamed that I picked up the gun and, sitting in my armchair, pointed it straight at my heart. At my heart and not at my head, for I had firmly resolved to shoot myself through the head, through the right temple, to be precise. Having aimed the gun at my breast, I paused for a second or two, and suddenly my candle, the table, and the wall began moving and swaying before me. I fired quickly. So it was, in my dream, I did not feel any pain. But it seemed as though, with my shot, everything within me was shaken and everything was suddenly extinguished, and a terrible darkness descended all around me. I seemed to have become blind and dumb. I was being carried in a closed coffin. I could feel the coffin swaying and I was thinking about it, and for the first time the idea flashed through my mind that I was dead. Dead as a doornail. That I knew it that there was not the least doubt about it, that I could neither see nor move, and yet I could feel in reason. But I was soon reconciled to that, and, as usually happens in dreams, I accepted the facts without questioning them. And now I was buried in the earth. They all went away, and I was left alone, entirely alone. I did not move, whether before I imagined how I should be buried in a grave, there was only one sensation I actually associated with the grave, namely that of cold and damp. And so it was now. I felt that I was very cold and very damp, especially in the tips of my toes, but I felt nothing else. I lay in my grave, and, strange to say, I did not expect anything. Accepting the idea that a dead man had nothing to expect as an incontestable fact. But it was damp. I don't know how long a time passed, whether an hour or several days or many days. But
but suddenly a drop of water which had seeped through the lid of the coffin fell on my closed left eye. It was followed by another drop a minute later, then after another minute by another drop and so on. One drop every minute. All at once deep indignation blazed up in my heart and I suddenly felt a twinge of physical pain in it. That's my wound, I thought. It's the shot I fired. There's a bullet there. And drop after drop still kept falling every minute on my closed eyelid. I cried out for help, but there was silence. Then my grave was opened. I don't know, that is, whether it was opened or dug open, but I was seized by some dark and unknown beings. I got the sense they were playful and high-spirited like children. They wandered about their beautiful woods and groves. They sang their beautiful songs. They lived on simple food, the fruits of their trees, the honey from their woods, and the milk of the animals that loved them. They shrouded me with love. I kept crying, deeply moved by an uncontrollable, rapturous love for the dear old earth that I had chosen to leave behind. They looked at me with their dear eyes full of love. When I realised that in their presence my heart, too, became as innocent and truthful as theirs, I did not regret my inability to understand them fully either. The sensation of the fullness of life left me breathless, and I worshipped them in silence. The face of the poor little girl I had treated so badly flashed through my mind. Ungrateful wretch that I am. I extinguished my life by shooting myself through the heart. But never, never have I ceased to love that earth. And even on the night I parted from it, well, you see, again let me repeat. All right, let us assume it was only a dream. But the sensation of the love of those innocent and beautiful unknown beings has remained with me. There was reason to believe that they communicated with the departed after death. Oh, everyone laughs in my face now when everyone assures me that I could not possibly have seen and felt anything so definite. But nonetheless, it was quite possibly a thousand times better, brighter and more joyful than I described it. What if it was only a dream? Or that couldn't possibly not have been. And you know, I think I'll tell you a secret. Perhaps it was no dream at all. For what happened afterwards was so awful, so horribly true that it couldn't possibly have been a mere coinage of my brain seen in a dream. Oh, judge for yourselves. I have been concealing it all the time. But now I will tell you the whole truth. The fact is, I corrupted them all. Yes. Yes, it ended in my corrupting them all. How it could have happened, I do not know. But I remember it clearly. The dream encompassed thousands of years and left in me only a vague sensation of the whole. I only know that the cause of the fall was me. Like a horrible trachina. Like the germ of the plague infecting whole kingdoms, so did I infect with myself all that happy earth that knew no sin before me. They learned to lie, and they grew to appreciate the beauty of a lie. Or perhaps it all began innocently, with a jest the desire to show off with amorous play and perhaps indeed only with a germ. But this germ made its way into their hearts and they liked it. The voluptuousness was soon born. Voluptuousness begot jealousy and jealousy, cruelty. Oh, I don't know. I can't remember. But soon, very soon, the first blood was shed. They were shocked and horrified, and they began to separate and to shun one another. They formed alliances, but it was one against another. Recriminations began. Reproaches. 
They came to know shame and they made shame into a virtue. The conception of honour was born, and every alliance raised its own standard. They began torturing animals, and the animals ran away from them into the forests and became their enemies. A struggle began for separation, for isolation, for personality, for mine and thine. They began talking in different languages. They came to know sorrow, and they loved sorrow. They thirsted for suffering, and they said that truth could only be attained through suffering. It was then that science made its appearance among them. When they became wicked, they began talking of brotherhood and humanity, and understood the meaning of those ideas. When they became guilty of crimes, they invented justice, and drew up whole codes of law, and to ensure the carrying out of their laws, they erected a guillotine. They only vaguely remembered what they had lost, and they would not believe that they were ever happy and innocent. They even laughed at the possibility of their former happiness, and called it a dream. They announced they had science, and with its aid they shall again discover truth. Though they made it clear, we shall accept it only when we perceive it with our reason. They held the belief, knowledge is higher than feeling, and the consciousness of life is higher than life. And science will give us wisdom, wisdom will reveal us the laws, and the knowledge of the laws of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what they said to me. And having uttered those words, each of them began to love himself better than anyone else. More pain and anguish occurred beyond anything I can express. More great wars came and went. Horror and pain crippled all of the beautiful creatures that were no longer beautiful. I walked among them, wringing my hands and weeping over them. But I loved them perhaps more than before, when there was no sign of suffering in their faces, and when they were innocent and, oh, so beautiful. I loved the earth they had polluted even more than when it had been a paradise, and only because sorrow had made its appearance on it. Alas, I always loved sorrow and affliction, but only for myself. Only for myself. For them, I wept now, for I pitied them. I stretched up my hands to them, accusing, cursing and despising myself. I told them that I alone was responsible for it all. I alone. That it was me who had brought them corruption, contamination and lies. I implored them to crucify me, and I taught them how to make the cross. I could not kill myself. I had not the courage to do it. But I longed to receive martyrdom at their hands. I thirsted for martyrdom. I yearned for my blood to be shed to the last drop in torment and suffering. But they only laughed at me. And in the end, they began looking upon me as a madwoman. They justified me. They said that they had got what they themselves wanted, and that what was now could not have been otherwise. At last they told me that I was becoming dangerous to them, and that they would lock me up in a lunatic asylum if I did not hold my peace. Then sorrow entered my soul with such force that my heart was wrung, and I felt as though I were dying. And then... Well, then I awoke. It was morning. That is, the sun had not risen yet, but it was about six o'clock. When I came to, I found myself in the same armchair. My candle had burnt out. In the captain's room all were asleep, and silence so rare in our house reigned around. The first thing I did was to jump up in great amazement. Nothing like this had ever happened to me before. Oh, how I longed for life, life. I lifted up my hands and called upon eternal truth. No, not called upon it, but wept. Rapture, infinite and boundless rapture, intoxicated me. Yes, life and preaching. 
I made up my mind to preach from that very moment and, of course, to go on preaching all my life. I am going to preach. I want to preach. What? Why, truth? For I have beheld truth. I have beheld it with my own eyes. I have beheld it in all its glory. And since then I have been preaching. For I have beheld the truth. I have beheld it, and I know that people can be happy and beautiful without losing their ability to live on earth. I will not, and I cannot believe that evil is the normal condition among men. And yet they all laugh at this faith. But how can I help believing it? I have beheld it. The truth. I had invented it. I have beheld it. I have beheld it, and the living image of it has filled my soul for ever. I have beheld it in all its glory, and I cannot believe that it cannot exist among men. Truth whispered to me that I was lying, and so preserved me and set me on the right path. And really how simple it all is. In one day, in one hour, everything could be arranged at once. The chief principle? Well... To love your neighbour as yourself, of course. That is a chief principle. And that is everything. For nothing else matters. Once you do that, you will discover at once how everything can be arranged. And yet it is an old truth. A truth that has been told over and over again. But in spite of that, it finds no place among men. The consciousness of life is higher than life. The knowledge of happiness is higher than happiness. That is what we have to fight against. I shall. I shall fight against it. If only we all wanted it, everything could be arranged immediately. And I did find that little girl. And I shall go on. I shall go on.